I'm Richard Harris, and welcome to Real Risk, the podcast that talks to people who put themselves in harm's way. You know the type. Big wave surfers, professional soldiers, base jumpers. I'll get inside the heads of men and women who seem fearless or even reckless. They might seem crazy to us, but most are far from it. We'll be talking about putting your life on the line for something important. We're talking about real risk. Thanks for joining me for episode one, The Good Doctor. Yep, that's me. And it's Harry, by the way. Pretty much only my mother called me Richard. It seems that any podcast should start with an introduction and some sort of explanation. I guess if I want you to join me on this journey and enjoy the ride, you should probably get to know me first. I have to say it, starting a podcast is a frightening thing to do. It's a risk. Not life and death, but a risk to your ego and your confidence, even your reputation. It's like writing a book, penning a song or creating a piece of artwork which you plan to show the world. The chances are it's just going to be another piece of digital crap to float through the ether for eternity listened to by a few or ignored or forgotten. It's confronting. Actually, it's presumptuous and self-indulgent. So what possesses me or anyone to give it a go? Well, in my case, it's a couple of things. I do have some questions that have really been burning me up and I want some answers. And secondly, and maybe embarrassingly, I am a bit of a technophile and the idea of playing with microphones, a mixer and some editing software was too much to resist. So here I am. Don't worry, this monologue will be brief and then we'll get into some really interesting guests. So in the words of Talking Heads, how did I get here? Take a look at your bookshelf. Does it contain multiple copies of non-fiction which share the same theme? Into thin air, perhaps? Touching the void? Caverns measureless to man? What about some stories of some idiots rowing tiny boats across oceans or riding a bike across the Sahara? I was trying to count these kind of books at home, but actually I ended up thinking it was easier to count the ones that weren't like that. But the exceptions were still hardly highbrow literature, one on still boat building and a textbook on wilderness medicine. So how does a middle-aged Aussie doctor get obsessed in all these rather painful and dangerous pursuits? I don't really remember when it started. It seems a bit ghoulish to enjoy reading other people's suffering, but I enjoy it. They all seem to have some higher purpose in mind. They all seem to be learning something about themselves, and I wanted to pursue that feeling. I just didn't know if I had what it takes, whatever it is. I felt a deep resonance with these people. I didn't think they were reckless or selfish or suicidal. It all seemed really valid, heroic even, all for a higher cause. But I have worked out now that most people don't feel the same way. After 20 years of technical diving myself, with a particular focus on deep cave exploration, I've gotten pretty used to people telling me that I must have a death wish, that I'm mad. I understand that diving in a flooded cave is the stuff nightmares are made of for many people. And hey, I feel the same way about Alex Honnold climbing El Capitan without a rope. It's beyond my comprehension. But I bet Alex didn't start out by climbing a sheer face, holding on by nothing but his fingertips 100 metres above the earth. He probably worked his way up, gradually acclimatising, overcoming his instinctual fear of falling. And no doubt he quickly discovered he had a knack for it and he felt a desire to challenge himself more and more as his skills developed. I doubt he woke up one day and said, Today I'm going to do a climb so outrageously difficult that I will surely die. Now he's crazy by our standards, but he isn't diagnosably mad. Well he might be, but I'm not a psychiatrist so I wouldn't really know. But you take my point. What he does is edgy, but probably comfortable for him. He's pushing himself, and he's probably nervous or scared before a climb, but I doubt he believes he will die that day, or he wouldn't proceed. In fact, a healthy dose of fear is protective. It keeps us alive. Excessive fear is paralysing and dangerous in itself. This mixture of healthy fear but overall confidence is the way I feel about exploring underwater caves. Anyway, I digress. I started diving when I was about 13 years old. Family friends had a hooker. That's not the kind you smoke and it's definitely not the other kind. It's an air compressor that you leave on the boat and it supplies air to the diver through a hose. As a kid, I'd dive and collect oysters and scallops for mum and dad up on the boat. I fell in love with the ocean, and I dreamt of being a marine biologist. In 1979, at the age of 15, I did a dive course, and I continued diving and taking underwater photos throughout university. Then in 1986, a pivotal moment, I did a cave diving course with friends from uni, and then in about the year 2000, 
I really got obsessed with the sport, especially the idea of exploration and finding new caves. That exploration has taken me all around the world, and along with a small group of great mates nicknamed the Wet Mules, and that's another story, we started doing some increasingly bold projects. Look, it's risky compared to the weekend cave diving we sometimes do because of the depths and distances from the entrance to the caves, but despite popular opinion, cave diving is not the world's most dangerous sport, although proponents of the activity don't mind letting people imagine that it is. It's kind of good for the ego to have people think you're doing something slightly dodgy whilst knowing you actually have far more chance of dying in a car accident on the way to the cave. But exploration cave diving does increase the risks, and they need to be well managed, and deep exploration probably pushes the risks higher again. But through careful planning, obsessive attention to detail, and a gradual build-up of experience, we think it can be done safely. Well, obviously, we wouldn't do it. Again, I don't have a death wish, and I wouldn't do this if I thought I was going to die. I don't consider myself brave, and like most proponents of high-risk adventure activities, I believe the process of executing a safe dive is as far away from an adrenaline-seeking experience as a game of chess is. It can be nerve-wracking, but it's actually far more cerebral than anything else. Sometimes it isn't even physically that hard. I've certainly never described myself as an athlete. When I think of adrenaline junkies, I think of bull riders or base jumpers. Maybe of someone hitting the go-go button on a nitro fueled drag bike. But watching Alex Honnold climb that bloody hill in free solo reminded me of a cross between a chess master and a ballerina. It was spellbinding and beautiful to watch. I felt like his heart rate barely hit 50. And when he got to the top, he didn't scream like a banshee. He might have smiled, but I can't remember. And then he just hiked back down the hill. This is all conjecture, of course. I want to actually talk to these guys. Chat with Alex if I can. Shoot the breeze with a bull rider and a base jumper. What makes these people tick? Are they like me? I can't imagine they are. Do they think they can do this safely if they train and plan and concentrate? Or do they think this ride or jump or climb could be their last every time they set out? How could that be sustainable? You're listening to Real Risk, the adventure podcast with Richard Harris. In 2018, after years of training in volunteer cave rescue, my good buddy Craig Challen and I were called to the Tam Luang Cave in Chiang Rai, Thailand, to help with the rescue of the 12 boys and their soccer coach from the Wild Boars team. Us divers and the other rescuers were called heroes after the mission succeeded. Craig and I were awarded a bravery medal by the Australian and Thai governments and ended up becoming the 2019 Joint Australians of the Year. Look, that was an incredible honour, and we have met some extraordinary people as a result. It's a big deal in this country, and it's hard to live up to the award, especially when you look at the previous recipients. One thing I want to do with the increased profile that followed is to explore the opportunities this has given me, and hopefully that will include convincing interesting people to come on this podcast to share their stories, their insights, their passion for what most folks think are activities that define them as crazy. For me, what they do constitutes real risk. So of all the topics for a podcast, how did I arrive at this one? Well, I guess at the end of the day, I often wonder why I feel like I can do a deep cave dive, but the thought of so many other activities really scares me. Contact sports, for example. I was a really, really ordinary player at Aussie Rules footy, rugby and soccer. I felt lost out there on the field. I could never work out where the ball was going to be and so I seem to be following the play the whole time, while others more adept at the sport seem to understand that kind of invisible choreography that magically puts them in the right spot to receive the mark every time. It frustrated the hell out of me. And heaven forbid the ball actually would land on me. (laughs) Inevitably, things would not end well for me, the ball, or the scoreboard. So I ended up in more individual pursuits. I did some target shooting and archery, which I enjoyed. Photography, bushwalking, camping and then diving all seemed to suit me. And I've found this to be a common theme amongst other cave divers. Didn't play well with others might be a quote from many explorers' report cards, I suspect. Is there a type, a type of person that ends up in these kinds of activities? Studies have looked at risk-taking behaviours like gambling, drug-taking and promiscuity and found there may actually be a genetic marker that can be identified in such individuals. Sometimes this predisposition can lead to great success in business and finance, but often obviously it leads to dreadful social outcomes. A well-known diver and psychologist who I hope to get on the show 
has studied personality traits in cave divers and found specific types depending on their preferred goals in the cave. For example, explorers seem to be one type. When I look around me, I see the guys and girls who want to be the ones to get to the end of the line. That's the point in the cave dive where the new exploration starts, kind of where the rubber hits the road, if you like. Yeah, I see them to be the individualistic, strong personalities, egocentric and pretty driven. Often the ones with that unkind comment on their report card. These guys, and they are mostly but not exclusively men, are type A personalities. And it's not uncommon to hear of some famous bust-ups when they're away on trips together. And the more astute amongst you might realise that I have to include myself in this group. Hey, insight's a wonderful thing. So I got to wondering, if I can talk to a range of men and women who I consider to be leaders in their field, would I get a sense of what type they represent? Will the base jumpers be larger-than-life extroverts who hoop and holler before they throw themselves off the cliff, mentally tossing a coin as to whether they expect to survive the jump? Will the solo ocean circumnavigator be an idealistic poet, an introvert who's trying to find the meaning of life? That bull rider will surely be as tough as grit, a boy named Sue who grew up quick and mean. Yeah, sorry for the Johnny Cash reference. And the sniper, perhaps, a steely assassin who makes your blood run cold with a mere glance. The last thing I want to talk about is how does risk-taking affect the ones we love? I know that every time I walk out the door to go cave diving, my wife worries. It is selfish to the extreme. I participate in a sport, a hobby, which might kill me. I go off on an expedition and I'm out of range deep in the mountains or far off in a desert beyond the range of cell phones. Sometimes the sat phone doesn't even work. And she waits patiently for word that I'm safe. Why would I do that to her? I'd like to say it's part of who I am, part of my DNA. The desire to challenge myself to do hard things and overcome my fears makes me better able to face the day-to-day realities of life. It makes me whole, makes me a better person. And I find the solitude of the cave and the underwater realm really, truly meditative. It's enormously restorative and I feel like it clears the cobwebs of work and taxes and the daily dramas so I can return better than I left. But is all that a bit of a wank, if you'll pardon my French? Because no sooner do I get home and I'm thinking about the next challenge while I edit the images and write the reports from the last trip. How can we get further or deeper into the cave? We found 100 metres of new passage, but if we tried harder, that could have been so much more. I find myself comparing our discoveries to the old explorers who navigated a world ripe for discovery. And of course, you're always going to come up short against those guys, never satisfied. Genuine exploration is like heroin in your veins. The next dose needs to be bigger to get the same thrill, and we all know how that ends. Many of us have had friends who have died in pursuit of satisfying this need to be able to say, that was the dive, I did it, that was enough. In 2001, I was transforming my diving from recreational to technical. Technical diving is where you start to push beyond the single tank open water experience by using more tanks, different gases, closed circuit rebreathers and other equipment. This propels you into deeper dives, decompression dives, Caves, virgin shipwrecks, all the really good stuff. But that year I got word that an old schoolmate of mine, Mark Oricht, had died on an attempt on Everest. That really struck a chord with me. Mark was an amazing athlete. He'd started a personal training business when most people had never even heard of that concept. I certainly hadn't. How rich, I thought, would you have to be to hire someone to go jogging with you? I thought it was madness. No one would ever do that. But of course it was genius. And then he was gone, doing something he loved. Oh, by the way, my wife has always said that if I do perish in a cave, if someone says at least he was doing something he loved, she'll punch him in the face. I'm just saying. The divers I've known who have died have, by and large, been people I've really respected and admired for their skill and courage. But why have they perished when others, including myself, have not? There's too many factors to consider, I guess. But the reality of death is ever-present, and yet adventurers and extreme athletes can and must push this aside to achieve their goals. It really defies comprehension. So I want to comprehend it, and I want to hear some cracking good yarns in the process. So enough jibber-jabber from me. It's time to leave the theory behind and get on with some real-life experience, straight from the mouths of the protagonists. So I'll see you in the next episode to hear how this lot handle the real risks. That's it for this episode of Real Risk. If you're a risk-taker or know someone who'd be good for the show, please send me an email on admin at speleopix.com.au. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what you think of the podcast. 
subscribe, give me a rating, but most importantly, join me for the next one. We'll see you again on Real Risk. Real Risk.